a very busy Wednesday in women's basketball. And we have a treat for you. Debbie Antonelli here to talk all about it. ACC, the work she does off the court as well. So much more Locked on Women's Basketball starts now. Welcome to the for the win. You are Locked on Women's Basketball. Your daily podcast on women's basketball. Well, hi, everyone, and happy Wednesday. I'm Howard McDonald, welcoming you to Locked on Women's Basketball. I want to thank you for making us your first visit every day, showing up for us the way we show up for you. Over 175,000 listeners in January alone and counting. So thank you so much for being part of our family, our entire family. It is not just me. It is the next over at thenexthoops.com. Over 100 reported pieces on women's basketball every single month. Make sure you sign up $9 a month, $72 a year for getting them all delivered right to your inbox. And man, it is a crazy time in women's basketball. So I am always delighted to have Debbie Antonelli here to help me make sense of it as she has uh, for for years. Uh, Friend, great to see you. Thank you for taking the time. Let's just start right in with the ACC in segment one. And I'm going to start you with this. What is Duke? What is Duke? <laughs> I'm just in a little well, bit open-ended. You know what, Howard? First of all, thanks for having me on. And friend is the operative word here. I love that. You have done such a great job carving out a niche for yourself in our game. And I'm so grateful that you spend all the time that you do and have helped the business grow on that side. And um, thank you. So we, we need more people like you that are as invested and want to help the game grow. Um, Duke, interesting. Very good defensively. Very young team. Um, up and down. I think you get that with a young team. I think, uh, you know, the consistency of how they play defensively has been pretty solid. I think offensively has been their challenge. And that doesn't mean they don't have the pieces to make a run. I think they can put it together. I think that makes them very volatile, very dangerous. And, uh, you know, I think their best basketball is certainly ahead of them in February. It's fascinating when you look at even just, I I mean, just take the last two games, right? That win over Florida State. And I saw that Florida State team earlier this year, you know, is not just Tania Latson. That is a very interesting, Mm -hmm. deep team in a lot of different ways. And they just crushed them, 88 to 46. And then to come back out a couple of days later and not be able to put points on the board. Like you said, it, it feels almost like this is a team that can put points on the board. It, the limitations aren't uh, with capacity, but rather with that consistency. Yes, we're talking young, but in some ways, is this team built to ultimately figure out that consistency? February is where we're going to learn so much, obviously. Well, I think spirit would be the word. Uh, Florida State lost theirs, and um, I think that was part of the the margin. Uh, was mm. so wide. You know, keep in mind, Brooke uh, Wise, Cough is battling cancer and has had some treatments and she has gone to a wig and maybe many people haven't noticed that or not. I noticed it right away. I happened to be on campus for a men's game uh, the week that she was having a treatment, which she didn't tell me that she was having one. But uh, that was, uh, I think, the third game in their little slide. But I expect them to come back because they have too much talent in the backcourt and too many players that can score. Um, And for Duke, um, I don't know. I mean, you know, we're, that's a place where uh, no one's allowed in practice. No one's allowed to shoot around. Uh, it's a very tight um, ship. So um, it's hard to really diagnose or to evaluate or to give you a straight up. You know, as long as I've been in the game, I've always had a chance to sort of be behind the scenes to be able to provide a better answer. But because we don't get to do that, I'd say we don't know. Um, yeah. And it, so it, it's I a think disservice, that, frankly, it's a disservice. Well, it's an interesting philosophy. I'll say that it's different than what we usually do in the women's game. Um, and if it works for them, then it works. Uh, I'm not going to be critical of it because I really don't know why the, no one is allowed. I'm not really sure what that answer is. I'm not sure any of us have ever gotten it. Or if, if there is an answer, I don't know what it is. Right. Uh, wow. So to be fair, I'm just going to say, you know, 
I don't know. I mean, uh, you got to really study their team hard to figure out what it might be. And you got to decide if it's worth it. You know, are they an NCAA tournament team? I think they could be. I think their February is going to matter. Yeah. I mean, it's fascinating. And to your point, look, as of right now, they've got a net rating of 24. So they're clearly in the mix. Mm -hmm. But something that uh, no one's going to be able to put behind closed doors is a five game stretch from the 11th through the 22nd of February. And just just imagine this hosting North Carolina at Virginia Tech, hosting Notre Dame at Syracuse and <laughs> hosting NC State. That is yeah. a tough 11 day stretch for anyone. So it'll be fascinating to see. Ultimately, that's going to be fun. Yeah. Ultimately, for me, I think a lot of the fun in this ACC comes from the freshmen. And so I touched on Notre Dame a moment ago, but Hannah Hidalgo, who uh, I, I have to put in a plug from New Jersey, from South Jersey, right near, uh, right near me. Yeah, uh, came out of Paul the Sixth and Haddonfield, New Jersey. But Hannah Hidalgo seems to be showing that none of the rules that apply to freshmen, you know, oh, they're not fearless enough. Oh, you can't have a freshman run your team. Oh, in key moments late, the lack of experience is going to tell. None of them seem to apply to her. What What do you mm -hmm. see? From Hannah, who I will just say, sneak peek, she will be on our show coming up later this month. <laughs> Pure joy is one thing. Uh, I see that. I'm starting to say that more about players because I really appreciate those that really love the game, and regardless of the landscape or what's going on out there, or, you know, what they're involved in or not involved in. It's just pure joy and a skill set to match. And it's fun to watch. And, you know, I, I knew she could score. I knew she had some good talent around her. I thought at the beginning of the season, she was looking to score more than she was looking to get others involved. Now I think she's finding that blend. And I think she feels ownership on the team. You know, lingering in the back was, you know, is Citron going to get healthy? Is Miles going to get healthy? Well, now we know the answer to those things. And I really think um, the show that she put on at UConn and, you know, for me on the defensive side, when she had seven steals against the Miami backcourt, to me, that was the one that opened my eyes and went, okay, wait a second, this kid's legit. So, She's on every list, and she should be. She's very talented. It, it's remarkable. You know, just to kind of dive deep uh, into the numbers, she is a hair's breadth from a 50-40-80 season right now on the mm -hmm. offensive end, and assist percentage north of 30, and the turnover percentage 15.2, so not making the number of mistakes you often see out of freshman playmakers. But like you said, that's the biggest one to me, 5.6% steal percentage. That is Tops in the nation, not among freshmen, tops in the nation among everyone. Being able to have a nose for the ball that early on just seems to indicate a ceiling almost kind of incalculable. When you think where she can get to, I just wonder who the comp is. You know, I, I see a lot of Lexi Brown was great at collecting steals in droves, but she's obviously mm -hmm. scoring and uh, distributing at a level that's, you know, beyond what Lexi did at Maryland or Duke. Do you see a comp for kind of where she is and where she's going? I mean, it's a stretch a little bit because it's still some time. But uh, Andrea Riley, who was a great player at Oklahoma State in the Big 12, I mean, right away when you asked me for a, a comp, that's the first person I thought of. Yeah. Great college player, right? Um, was a leading scorer in the history of the Big 12. I covered all of her seasons while she was at Oklahoma State. I knew how good and talented she was. Um, she's, she's interesting to me. That would be an interesting comp. Um, I don't know. I hadn't really given it much thought, but that's the first uh, that comes to mind. I like it. I, I like that a lot. And and Notre Dame, of course, in really good position. That's a big non-conference win over UConn. 10th in net rating right now uh, among the leaders. But by no means is this conference settled. And I guess when you think about the leadership right now, we'll get into it a little more, especially in segment two. Notre Dame is five and three in the conference. So as of right now, they're not even among the top four at seven wins apiece, Louisville, Syracuse, Virginia Tech, and North Carolina. And then you got NC State there at six. Florida State comes in at six and four, an absolute free-for-all. Uh, we'll get That's into great. Yeah, I, I mean, <laughs> more in segment two about more of these leaders. But um, I, I'll, the food for thought as we head into our break, and I won't put you on the spot until after the break, is who's the favorite right now if you had to pick one? So I, I'm going to leave you with that while we share our sponsor. Be back with you in just a second. But first... 
I want to talk to you guys about eBay Motors, who are today's sponsor. And eBay Motors is doing an interesting thing. They have teamed up with our Locked On Fantasy Basketball host, Josh Lloyd, to bring you some of the best fantasy picks each week, all season long. Whether you're prepping for a daily draft or scouting the waiver wire, every week we're going to provide you some players that are guaranteed to fit on your roster. So let's see who Josh has picked out for us on this week's eBay's Guaranteed Fit Fantasy Picks of the Week. And just note, these are NBA Fantasy Picks. NBA, which is uh, a basketball league that you are welcome to watch when women's basketball is not on. So let's take a look. Josh Hart, I think, is the one for me. I mean, he's got Jared Vanderbilt on that list, Paul Reed, Aaron Nesmith. But Josh Hart, of course, uh, one of the many Villanova talents who have made their way to the New York Knicks. Well, Julius Randle was injured. And so Hart has been getting the regular minutes for the Knicks, what I think you're going to start to see now, in addition, is he's going to get more touches. You're going to see that usage rate go up, and he's going to end up being helpful to your fantasy team. Now, look, useful to your fantasy team is what Josh Lloyd does. eBay Motors is doing it for your car. They find you the perfect fit. And with over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you can make sure your ride stays running smoothly, which is super helpful to me because I don't know the first thing about cars, but eBay Motors does. Brake kits, LED headlights, roof rack, bumpers, whatever your car needs, eBay Motors has it. And with an eBay guaranteed fit, it is guaranteed to fit your ride the first time, every time, or your money back. Plus, at these prices, you're burning rubber, not cash. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. eBay guaranteed fit, only available to U.S. customers. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. So we are back with Debbie Antonelli. And so, Debbie, if you are feeling so bold, four teams with seven wins, as we're talking right now, a lot more in the mix. Who's your favorite right now to win the ACC, subject to change? Yeah, I mean, this could be a power poll inside the league every night because I think matchups when you play where you play is so critical when you play an unbalanced schedule like the Power Fives play, especially in the ACC when there are, I think there's six or seven teams ranked and, you know, it looks like they're going to get nine in the NCAA tournament potentially, so It's a pretty tough league, and it's been a really good league. The Pac-12 is a good league, but the ACC has the potential to get more teams in. Depends on how you look at all that stuff, whether you think one league's better than another. I kind of stay away from that conversation because I don't think it matters. But um, uh, in the ACC, to your question and to your point, you know, NC State's the highest-ranked team. Louisville is sitting in first place, and nobody's talking about them. I think right now NC State would be the team that has shown the most consistency along with Louisville. There hasn't been that great of a dip. Playing at Miami for NC State is always a trouble down there. Katie Meyer's schemes with her guards seem to always be a matchup issue. Uh, But I I think, um, you know, on Monday night, coming up on Monday night in a play for K game, Louisville's playing at NC State, and these are the top two teams in the league in my estimation right now. And I think whoever wins that game is going to be um, ahead in uh, the race towards the end. But As you know, most importantly, it's not just winning the regular season. It is finishing the top four so you get that double bye in the ACC tournament, which is absolutely brutal to play in. So um, I'd say NC State and Louisville, and if I had to pick one right now, I think NC State has the edge. Both of them are such interesting teams. Let's talk about Louisville a little bit because you're right. I don't feel like they are getting as much press as they ought to. And my particular favorite to watch – on Louisville is Kiki Jefferson. Seeing her mm-hmm. make this transition from James Madison, she's been on the program and she had her eyes on coming to a Power Five program. It's really been seamless the way she has become a key contributor for Jeff Wall. Take me through though what you're seeing out of her and of Louisville writ large. It's allowed them to navigate, you know, a lot of transition, obviously, from last year. Well, I mean, let's look at Louisville, right? Eight, uh, five consecutive elite eights. OK, and they've been in the final four in that mix as well. Uh, he's had Jeff Walls has had an ACC player of the year candidate in each of those years. And I don't think he has one this year. And that's not a bad thing. Uh, I think, um, you know, the way they grind it out on defense, the way they can shrink the game, uh, the way they can shrink the court. Uh, Olivia Cochran is having her best year as a post player. And he's 
put her in some face-up opportunity. She wanted to play the three last year. She tried a little. It just didn't work. But I see this year she's a little bit better. And after having a summer of skill development with Jeff and his staff, um, I, but I think this is an interesting spot for Louisville, which I think makes them really fun to watch because they are a grinded out defensive team. They're not getting the headlines like they typically get. They're still packing their house and no one's talking about it, yet they just keep winning. Uh, it's an, it's a an, uh, different place for them, but I think it's one that they like because they're a little bit under the radar and they're not used to, you know, being the underdog in several situations or just a little bit of a glimpse below conversation not in talent or not in uh, competitiveness or in toughness but just uh, in conversation which i think is a spin that i know jeff walls will use to his be- uh, advantage i am certain of that jeff is very very good at finding that and and it is worth noting again the acc network just like every time i turn it on there's a tasty game to watch my dvr is filled with goodness. And so that's what's coming up here. Even before that play for K game, they're hosting Syracuse on Thursday night is Louisville. Mm-hmm. They've got this 10 day stretch home against Syracuse at NC state home against Notre Dame, and then going up to Syracuse. So from February 1st through yeah. the 11th, we're going to find out quite a bit. It also is probably worth noting Syracuse just keeps climbing in the ranks. You know, Alyssa Latham is doing things that, I guess I feel like they're getting a little bit overshadowed by Hannah Hidalgo's freshman season, but most years in like a non Hidalgo, non Tania Latson season, Alyssa Latham's freshman of the year in the ACC, right? Well, she's certainly talented. That's for sure. And you're right. There is a little bit of a shadow there. Um, You know, the, the, the schedule that you mentioned uh, for, you know, Duke coming up, Louisville coming up, the harder part of their schedules are in front of them. So I think that's part of the reason why maybe there's not a lot of conversation about Louisville. They just have that opportunity for that quad one opportunity like the men's side. But those are coming, and we're going to find out a lot in the next couple of weeks about all of these teams because especially the ones that are at the top because they're going to start playing each other more. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. No question about it. I will just say we have uh, Jenna Kuniowski who covers the ACC for us at the next working on an Alyssa Latham story as well. Jenna uh, is uh, currently attending NC State, a college I think you have uh, some history with. (laughs) Yes, I do know that place well. (laughs) Doing a very good job uh, for us as well. So uh, as far as uh, 24 hours nbn.com, I want to make sure our listeners know it understand it. And and if you'll permit me a moment, um, I'm, I'm proud to donate. Uh, I would urge everyone to do this as Thank well. You. What Debbie does every year is shoots free throws for 24 hours straight, 100 free throws every hour for 24 hours to raise money for the Special Olympics. Uh, my, my heart cannot go out to you any more than it does for what it is that you've done. You have raised so much money for this important goal. Uh, Go to the link right now. You have, as of this taping, raised $851,862. The goal is a million dollars this year. I want everyone who's listening to this program to go and contribute. Uh, Debbie, I'm just going to ask you just, we know how important Special Olympics is, not just to you, but to the world. I just want to know, how do you manage to do it for 24 hours? What's your secret? (laughs) Well, first of all, Howard, thank you for asking, because it is a a big part of my everyday thought process and uh, planning for May, May 18 and 19 in my driveway. And it it takes me about 15 minutes to make 100 every hour. And then we have a live stream so you can actually tune in and watch. Um, We've done it for five years. This will be our sixth year. And I ask everyone that... um, I know that if they just can give me one penny for every free throw I make, it's $24. I think everyone can do that for Special Olympics. It's not that big of an ask. And and most of the time people will go and, you know, they might give a little bit more. Um, eight, yeah, we're, we're going to hit a million, I hope, in May. And it's not something I ever thought. But the training and the fitness and the, the mental grind that comes with it, the emotional grind of it, um, all of it, it pays off because – I know exactly how the money impacts families like mine and how it helps, 
My son, um, Frankie, is a graduate of the Clemson Life Program. Life is an acronym. Learning is for everyone. He would not have been able to go to college if he didn't have the confidence and the belief that he could do it. And sport, as we know, plays a big role in that. We're involved in sport at such a high level that sometimes we forget exactly what it was supposed to be intended for, right? And and for athletes that need a little more time to train and organize and compete and socialize, this is a great landing spot for them at Special Olympics. But uh, I will just tell your, your listeners, this is how um, the training is significant. I will tell you that I do get AARP mail, so it's not getting easier for me to train. It's getting harder, as a matter of fact. But the um, I know we're going to hit a million. And the bar that you put in your door frame that you do pull-ups on, I put that in the driveway. And I go free throw, burpee, free throw, burpee. And I do 10 sets of 25 makes. I do that for a while. And then I get up to 50 um, four sets of 50 and then two sets of 100 and then the climb through the spring when I get to that point then I feel like I'm ready and it's not about the free throws I do want to shoot it at a high level though because I think it makes the story a little bit more um, interesting that people see me my age I'm out in the driveway I'm trying to make a difference and and I'm I'm raising money for Special Olympics the free throws are just the vehicle to get us there but uh, I will say my average last year, and I did break my finger on my left hand, my index finger, two weeks before the event training, uh, although um, I shot my best percentage. I shot 95%, but my five-year average is 94. Mm -hmm. So when people tune in, I don't want them to tune in and see an old lady shoot a bunch of bricks. I want to make them at a high level so that they'll go to the site and be interested and think that maybe you know they could give $24. That's the whole goal here and that's the hope and uh and every dollar goes because there's i'm doing it in my driveway it goes yeah. straight to the athletes there is a low overhead i own my own dish we do it in my driveway i mean like it, it's just amazing what we've been able to do and i never believed it would get to this point but we're our team is uh really good and solid and everybody helps out a lot and this year i'm having bleachers brought into my yard i mean we're going to have hundreds of people there on sunday when we cross a million it's going to be amazing, Debbie. And and <laughs> nobody would bet against you. I, I love that you're making <laughs> the Lena Deladon rate as well, which is not the least bit surprising. <laughs> yeah, shoot shoot until your arm falls off, to use a phrase. Uh, Literally. Somebody <laughs> that as well. I hope not. But we'll, we'll be back right in segment three. We want to talk a little bit bigger picture, state of the NCAA, NCAA tournament, and uh, let you guys – hear what Debbie has to say about that as well. Uh, but first, I want to tell you guys about LinkedIn. And LinkedIn has a real great opportunity through LinkedIn jobs. I can tell you as a small business owner myself that the most important thing is to hire the right people. All your success for your team depends on who you surround yourself with. And that's why LinkedIn Jobs has created tools to help you find the right professionals for your team faster and free. LinkedIn has a vast network of more than a billion professionals, which makes it definitely the best place to hire. Go ahead and post your job for free at LinkedIn.com slash LockedOnNBA. That's LinkedIn.com slash L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N-N-B-A to post your job for free. Make sure you're hiring the right people for your team. Terms and conditions apply. So, Debbie, we have talked conceptually about the NCAA tournament for a long time. And we've talked about, you know, your idea of having the Sweet 16 in one place. We're halfway there, halfway between that <laughs> right now with, you know, the two regionals uh, coming up this year. What do you think? Do you think we're where we need to be? Do you think there's more work to be done? How do you feel about the current state of the format of the NCAA tournament? Well, you're trying to get me fired here, Howard, because, you know. <laughs> no, please no. <laughs> no. We are partners, ESPN, with the NCAA. I am not speaking on behalf of ESPN. Yes. I'm just speaking on my own opinion. And you're right. I've talked about for 15 years. I've called it the Sweet 16 to Vegas. So I've been on this for a while thinking that, you know, an economy of scale with um, a separation from the corporate partner program to have our own autonomy to sell 
to create a synergy and a wow and, you know, to, to bring the to one spot and, and really for the fans, mm -hmm. besides removing geography from the equation for the fans to be able to have a, um, on Christmas morning, to be able to buy your airline, your hotel, your tickets to plan, to use your disposable income at that point to know what you're going to do. And, you know, one regional or one sweet 16 would accomplish that at a destination city, two regionals. I don't think that's halfway there. I still think it creates some of the similar problems um, that it would create for the fan. Uh, we still have geography in the equation, so that hasn't been removed. So um, it depends on how you evaluate it. Um, you know, I will say this. I do think that ESPN has done a remarkable job around the tournament. Uh, 10 million people combined with Caitlin Clark. Uh, I, I mean, that's the reason why people tuned in. Mm -hmm. um, it was just remarkable how on some different platforms ESPN was able to help create some storytelling and some options for the game to be told at a different level and shared on some other platforms. So I would say that, you know, you got to give ESPN some credit for some of that because I definitely think that the whole build during the regular season and everything to the season at the end was um, a really good management by ESPN to be able to do that. As far as the tournament goes with uh, the new media deal and the bundling of the sports. I think that was the right call. I mm -hmm. thought the estimates um, were too, too high. When mm -hmm. you go from zero to 60, meaning not selling to all of a sudden selling a hundred million dollars in women's basketball, that's a big target. And I often felt that somebody would fall on the sword on that. And I didn't want that to happen. I do think that, you know, <laughs> we've had a lot of opportunity to sell our game and, Thankfully, somebody like Caitlin Clark and the popularity of what she's been able to do has trickled into other markets and has increased the interest in the game, which makes it more sellable. We have creative inventory. We have to create our own inventory. We have to be able to figure out ways that we can sell the game at the highest level. And I do think that now that we have the media rights bundled in with the other sports, which I did think was the right thing to do, um, is going to advance our game. I just want somebody selling. I want us selling. There's a, and I don't want to take a unit unless we economically deserve it. I'm, I thought the first 50 years of Title IX is about opportunity. The next 50 should be about investment. And we have to sit at the table and be prepared to change and evolve our game so that we are a marketable and more sellable product. I think the economic forecast on our game is really good. And I think now we'll have the right people with the right eyeballs with the potential to sell our product at the highest level because – you know, the other thing besides shoot till your arm falls off that I've always said is the product is the narrative That's and the right. product is really good and it's been good for a long time. I don't have any disagreement with anything you said, nor would I think to do so. And that the next 50 are going to be about investment. I, that one's going to stick with me for a while. Debbie Antonelli, I am always grateful for your wisdom and the opportunity to speak with you about this and about anything. Thank you for your time to our listeners. I want to thank you for making us your first listen every day. We'll be back with you tomorrow with the great Maddie Sedris talking a little bit Villanova, a little bit Athletes Unlimited, a little bit Dallas wins as well. Until then, I am Howard Meddal wishing all of you a wonderful Wednesday. Welcome to Wally. For the win. You are Locked On Women's Basketball, your daily podcast on women's basketball.